to learn about the latest developments, we created what we call uh, like a virtual lab school, sort of like a replica of Stanford, like a school where the agents can actually go to the school and then try to teach themselves how to become a deeper expert in immunology or in chemistry. We're now delighted to be joined by Professor James Zhou from Stanford University. James, thank you for being here with us. Great to be here, thanks for having me. Great to have you, James. So I'd like to kick us off with virtual labs. So we're all very excited by this concept and don't really understand it. So could you explain to us kind of what a virtual lab is and your work around it? Yeah, so the virtual lab is basically a team of AI scientist agents that um, sort of mimics my own physical lab, right? So there's an AI professor agent, and under the professor is actually a bunch of different AI students, right, with expertise in chemistry or computational biology. And they work together with the AI professor to tackle these open-ended research problems. So the sort of the impetus for the virtual lab actually happened a couple years ago because you know, as a professor at Stanford, we have a lot more requests for collaborations and I have time to tackle physically. Right, and we thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if we actually have, um, if we could actually duplicate my lab infinitely many times with using AI models, so they can actually then have send the AI to do these different projects, right? And then with the recent advances in these language models like ChatGPT, we actually got much better at creating AI scientist agents based on these language models. So that's how we actually created the virtual lab. And do you have an example of like a success with the virtual lab, like in a in a context? Yeah, yeah, so actually one of the first problems that we asked the virtual lab to tackle was to help us to design new binders to the recent COVID variants. Right? So these are binders that are, could potentially be uh, possibly a good vaccine candidates. So it's quite a challenging open-ended research problem because you know, it's actually still very much a problem of if you have a new COVID variant and how do you actually find good binders that can bind to those variants. Um, and the team of the AI scientist agents, right, so they basically came up with a new idea of uh, designing a new computational pipeline that can use, be used to optimize nanobodies, which are sort of like small cousins of antibodies, they're small proteins, and they have this very clever workflow to design and optimize these nanobodies to bind to the spike protein of the COVID variant. Uh, so they implemented all of that, and we then did experiments to actually make these nanobodies in the real lab and then test them in the real lab. And we actually found that they were actually very good, uh, very promising candidates. How does your team feel about replicating them uh, in terms of AI on a server somewhere? Um, do, you know, are they, do they feel they're losing that collaborative um, joy you might get from sitting around a table and trying to tackle a problem? Because as a scientist myself, I find it quite enjoyable to, to collaborate with different expertise and you learn something. But is that, is, are you worried that that might be eroded by this process? It's a good question. Um, in our experience, we actually find that human scientists are more enabled by these kind of virtual lab agents. Uh, it's also a form of collaboration whereby you know, human researchers actually now we have to collaborate with the AI researchers, AI scientists. Um, so, for example, like, you know, if I want to work on a research project and it's useful to have an immunologist, it often could be pretty challenging to find an immunology expert. Right? Maybe I have to spend two weeks to set up a meeting and I can get half an hour from them and it's not that easy. But now that we have an immunologist agent, it's almost available to us 24-7 and we can work with that agent and collaborate with that agent to tackle problems that otherwise would have been much harder for us to do. So we view this as basically, you know, we create these different AI agents with the diverse expertise, then we can plug in those expertise into human teams, right, where are these, these to fill in important gaps. But how do you actually do it? How do you actually simulate that deep expertise? You talked about immunology. How do you get the AI to have the same amount of uh, expertise as a human professor? So that's a great question. And I'll just preface by saying that uh, they're not quite there yet, right? So we're still in early stages. Uh, but the way that we do this is that you can start with the, the latest frontier language models. So like a chat GPT model or like one of these Anthropic or Gemini models. And now those models already have quite good broad knowledge, which means that they've read a lot of papers and textbooks. So they know sort of generally like what's talked, you know, different immunology concepts but they may not be up to speed on the, like, the latest development in immuno-oncology or latest development in clinical trials and so on. Uh, now to give that 
the extra boost, right, to learn about the latest development, we created what we call uh, like a virtual lab school, sort of like a replica of Stanford, like a school where the agents can actually go to the school and then try to teach themselves on how to become a deeper expert in immunology or in chemistry. And the way that the school works is that um, you know, we tell the agents, here are some of the topics you should learn about. Maybe you should learn about immunotherapies or cell therapies. And then we enable the agents to actually go out to find textbooks and research papers, right? And to retrieve those papers and to read those papers. And as they read these papers and textbooks, then we also allow the model to basically fine tune themselves, which is basically, uh, in other words, they can update the parameters of the neural network as it's reading the papers to ingest that new information. And then also the agents have to do like a, a quiz, a self-assessment to see how well did they learn that topic. If they didn't learn it very well, they have to go back to school and then redo some of the classes. But their schools for the agents are actually um, much faster than human schools. Right? So it's usually a couple of days and they can um, develop a deeper expertise in one of these domains. That's fascinating. I cannot believe you have schools for AI. Can I send my AI to your <laughs> school? Um, another question I had about, obviously you mentioned whatever the frontier model is, you kind of use that as your base, right? Um, recently, for example, OpenAI updated uh, GPT-40 and it became extremely agreeable to everyone's irritation. So what happens in that scenario? Did you have a scenario where your PI became really, really agreeable and then suddenly not as skeptical as you had hoped? Does that kind of feed into your yeah. you know, AI um, agents in your virtual labs? That if there's a change from the top, I mean, we saw with Grok, there was a little bit of bumpiness with Grok 3 recently. Yes. So does, do you see that in your virtual labs? So we see that, uh, and I think that's this is a really interesting point is that when we have these different AI agents that interact and collaborate, right, they also develop their own social dynamics. So similar to when we sit in a table and talk and communicate, right, then, then you know, some people talk more than others and that sort of steers the direction in different ways. Uh, we also find that you know, that happens with the AI agents, right? So sometimes if the agents are actually too agreeable, that's actually not ideal for science in that you know, we actually want the different experts from different domains to have disagreements, right? And then they have to hash out and come to a resolution. And in that debate, that's actually where we see some of the most interesting and robust discussions in science happens. Uh, and actually one of the limitations of AI, what we found is that sometimes they're too agreeable. They agree with each other too much. And we had to do things like try to make them a bit more skeptical. Uh, so for example, we created like a critic agent, sort of like a reviewer agent that sits in on each of the virtual lab discussions so that the critic's job is to actually provide this more skeptical feedback to all of the other agents so that they get into this more sort of grounded discussions to you know, reduce hallucinations and so on. So what's kind of the next level for these, the, these agents in this virtual lab for you? What's kind of the next route forward? Yeah, so we're quite excited about the, um, these kind of virtual lab ideas, especially as the models continue to improve, which they do very quickly, right? Um, and for a lot of these different computational tasks, we think the models are becoming more and more capable. Right? Um, so we designed the virtual lab to be quite versatile to tackle different kinds of problems, right? So even though we did our initial experiments in designing nanobodies, we think that these kind of virtual lab AI scientist agents can also tackle many other problems, um, things from like maybe analyzing complex data sets to helping to design other kinds of uh, workflows and different kinds of proteins, or even to helping to provide suggestions on like clinical trial designs. Right? Um, so I think there are a lot of potential applications of these ideas of virtual lab that also stems from the fact that the agents can go to the school and teach themselves to be a deeper expert in domains that outside of my own areas. Can I just ask you a, a slightly different question, James? I mean, you talk about uh, co collaboration. Can I just ask you kind of how important it is for you, uh, you know, scientists based in Stanford, to come to this particular gathering here this week with the ISCB? Yeah, so it's actually uh, it's, this is you know, one of my favorite conferences, um, and I think there's a huge amount of value in having all these people from different universities, different countries come together in these scientific meetings and having a lot of these face-to-face -face discussions. Um, and you know, actually, many of the, um, the work that's being presented here is, I think, is really exciting, very cutting edge, and it also covers quite broad spectrum from like, biology and chemistry, you know, to a lot of areas that I, you know, I'd love to learn more about. And, and do you think that sort of you could use 
sort of this this virtual lab could you create a virtual conference to achieve the same thing maybe in a 10 years time well it's funny that you mentioned that um we just recently um launched an experimental conference um it's called agents for science where the paper is actually written by ai and also the review is also done by ai so it's like a ai run conference for ai research agents so we thought, okay, let's actually, let's actually do like an experimental conference where the AI is the author, right? And the AI is also the reviewer, right? Uh, and we'll basically do a final review by the human experts in the, for the final selections. But we really want to see what actually happens when you have these AI generated papers uh, with human co-authors and also how well can AI actually review those papers. Wow. Well, thanks ever so much indeed for coming to talk to us today. We've really, really enjoyed having you here and it's such a fascinating topic and so much to uh, get our teeth around. So thanks ever so much indeed, James. Well, thanks for having me. I think it's been a really fun discussion. Really enjoyed it. It's been it. great. Thank you so much. For thanks. Thank you.